Today we're going to be talking about loving enough to forgive. A few months back I talked about changing the wording in our mission statement from magnify God, mature believers, multiply the kingdom. It's a good mission statement. In fact, it comes just straight out of the Bible. It's what God told us we were to do. Uh, they're good church words. But that's the problem. Uh, church words sometimes get misunderstood. Even by Christians. What does it mean to magnify? Growing up, it was a magnifying glass. Looking at something bigger. To mature. To multiply. Uh, I wanted to change that worry in such a way as to make it more understandable for us as Christians. These new words in no way change the meaning, change what God has told us to do. Uh, and we as a church family have been called to do. Our mission as Christ followers is to be loving God completely, loving self correctly, and loving others compassionately. Magnify God is to lift Him up for others to see, to worship Him, to show others who He is. We do that by loving Him completely, with our entire being. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love Him with all our entire being. Not just church on Sundays, but every day of the week. Maturing believers is discipleship, becoming more like Jesus so that others will get a glimpse of Him in our life. We need to be constantly growing. Do you know that an alligator constantly grows until the day it dies? Uh, I just, what was it the other day? I saw a picture of an alligator who was 20 feet long. Imagine a 20 feet long alligator. This room is 30 feet wide, 30, 30 something feet wide. Dinosaurs grew until the day they died. That's just part of their DNA. We, spiritually, are to be growing until the day we die. We don't have an option to retire as we grow as a Christian. Uh, we need to learn how to live what Christ taught us, so that when others see us, they will get a glimpse of who He is. We need to develop relationships with other people. We do that because we learn how to live the Christian life. Uh, multiplying the kingdom is the third one. And that's where we really develop these relationships with those around us. So that they can not just see, but even hear. We need to develop relationships so that they get this glimpse of God and who He is. We need to learn how to love others compassionately. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about there being five kinds of people in your life. The VRPs. These are the very resourceful people. These are the ones who add to your life. Uh, they ignite passion in your life, in your living. They're your mentors. The ones that you choose to follow because you, there's just something about them that you want to, to emulate, to copy. Uh, these are usually older men or women. People that are willing to share their life experience and their wisdom with you in order to help you to grow and become more like Christ. It's very wise to seek these kinds of people out. Then there are the VIPs, the very important people. These are those who share your passion. The VRPs help you to develop passion, to find out what you're passionate about, the VIPs help you live it. They love you enough to ask you the hard questions, hold you accountable. They keep you honest by working alongside of you, sharing your vision. And then there were the VTPs, the very trainable people. These are the ones who catch your vision. They're usually newer to the faith. And we've been called by God, we may not even know, but we've been called by God to invest in their lives. We end up becoming their VIPs or their VRPs because they see in us something that they want. And so they look to us as their mentors. They're the very trainable people. Then the fourth group is the VNPs, the very nice people. These are the ones who enjoy your passion. 
but they don't contribute to your life in any way. Sad to say, this is where most of the people in churches are today. They're very important people. They want to sit and watch, allowing others to do all the work and enjoy the benefits of, of their work. Most, most church programs are focused on making these people happy because they seem to be the majority instead of doing what we were called to do, to reach out to others, to live our lives in front of others, to help them to grow. And the last group were the VDPs, the very draining people. These people sap our strength. They're the ones who complain about anything and everything and yet do nothing, constantly causing conflict with others in the church, looking for comfort, looking for recognition for themselves. It's hard to be around these people. And as you look around your life, in the church, where you work, where you live, you can probably find somebody from each one of these groups that you're associated with. We are to love all these people in our lives with the same kind of love. You don't love the, uh, the VRPs any more than you should love the VDPs. We need to love them with the same kind of, just like Jesus loves each one of us with the same kind of love. We're commanded to do that. There is no other option as a Christ follower. He commands us to love all. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It is a command, not an option. And all these people are your neighbors. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48 you have heard that our fathers were told, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Then you will become children of your Father in heaven. And that's a very important then. In order to become children of God, we accept Jesus, but this is also one of the other things that we show that. We love our enemies. We pray for our enemies. For he makes his sun shine on the good and the bad people alike. He sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous alike. What reward do you get if you love only those who love you? Why, even the tax collectors do that. And if you're friendly only to your friends, are you doing anything out of the ordinary? This is Jesus speaking. Which means that loving if you're friendly only to your friends, are you doing anything out of the ordinary? To be a Christian means we are to be extraordinary, loving those who are even our enemies. Even the Goyim, the Gentiles, do that. Therefore, because of all this other stuff, now be perfect. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Here we are told that to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, and when we do that, it guides us into God's perfection in our lives. Which he's also commanded us to do. Be perfect as he is perfect. Not an option. It is a command. We are to learn to grow. To love ourselves correctly. So that we can learn God's words and become more like Jesus. So that we, we can become more perfect. Become perfect as God is perfect, and we all know how perfect Yahweh God is. That is a challenge for each one of us. That is God's will for your life. And when we learn how to love like God loves, love always leads to forgiveness. See, love holds no record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians. How many of you remember all the bad things people have done to you? No other questions. I'm going to raise your hand, do you? See, when we do that, when we remember the bad things that people have done to us, we're making a record of wrongs. We're keeping track of all that stuff. And yet God says to forgive. If you're going to love your neighbor, you must forgive your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Anybody who comes in contact with you. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their offenses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, if you do not forgive others their offenses, your Heavenly Father will not forgive yours. What a warning. 
See, forgiveness is not an option in our life. I mean, sure, we get hurt. And our human response is to want to get revenge. And we, we do hold a grudge. But we have to overcome that with love. Because if we don't, if we want to hold on to that grudge, God cannot forgive us of our own sins. We build a roadblock, and He cannot help us to grow spiritually beyond that point until we learn to forgive. It has been said that there is no sin so great that God will not forgive, but there is no sin so small that it does not need to be forgiven. There isn't anything you can do that God cannot forgive, or will not forgive, except for one. It's blasphemy. What is blasphemy? It's called the unforgivable sin. See, God sees all sin as the same except this one. Why can't it not be forgiven? It's because it is denying who the Holy Spirit is. Because when you deny the Holy Spirit, you cannot be saved. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us. He's the one who convicts us. And if we're not going to respond to Him in any way, we're not even going to acknowledge He exists, we cannot be saved. You're dying, laying on, on your sick bed. There's a doctor standing there with a cure. If you do not acknowledge Him or the cure, you will die. Jesus offers us the cure. The Holy Spirit is the one who offers us personally. Jesus does it through His Holy Spirit. And if we're not going to respond to the Holy Spirit, then we cannot be saved. Now, could that person who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit ever be forgiven? I don't know. Unless he changes his thinking and will acknowledge the Holy Spirit and who he is, he cannot be changed. If the Holy Spirit cannot convict this person of sin, he cannot be saved. The question is, can this person ever soften his own heart enough to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to him? That I don't know. See, only God knows the heart of another human being. We see actions. We can make some assumptions, but I learned a long time ago, when you make assumptions, they're almost always wrong. Because an assumption is based on incomplete information. Can this person ever be saved? Only God knows his heart. Only God can make that decision. But we are also told that we are to judge ourselves and judge others who call themselves Christians. But we have to be very careful in what we do. God is the only one who determines whether a person goes to heaven or hell. The Old New Testament centered on the theme of redemption and forgiveness. The Bible from cover to cover deals with this theme. It's the whole reason Jesus came to earth. Because of what he did on the cross, God can offer us his gift of forgiveness without compromising his perfection, without compromising his justice, without compromising his character. Through the grace of divine forgiveness, our separation can be overcome. And a loving, secure relationship as true members of God's family can be started. This forgiveness involves a response to repentance and confession on our part. We must humble ourselves before God and admit the reality of our sinfulness. And sometimes that is hard to do for some people. We must humble ourselves before God. Ask Him for the gift of forgiveness for this new life in Christ. And after having put our trust in Christ alone for our salvation, we stay in fellowship with Him by asking the Holy Spirit to fill us, to search our heart, to reveal any areas of unconfessed sin, Acknowledge those, that sin to the Lord as sin. Ask Him to forgive you. And thank Him for His forgiveness. You are becoming perfect. As the Father is perfect. As you follow this process. As you go through this process. Day in and day out. Even after, we, after coming to Christ. Some of us find it hard. To accept God's unconditional forgiveness. We always put conditions on things. A lot of times we put conditions on our love. We expect people to act in a certain way or we won't love them. God doesn't do that. Even in His forgiveness, He does not put conditions on it. Well, there is one condition. Accept it. Ask me so I can forgive you. And then accept it. 
We have a natural disposition to think that we must work. That we must work off our debt. We must earn His forgiveness. Guilt feelings can cause us sometimes to revisit that sin over and over again. Whether in thought or action. Instead of laying hold of God's complete, unconditional forgiveness. Now we cannot out God. We cannot out the grace of God. We must learn to forgive ourselves in order to love ourselves correctly. This does not give us a license to go out and sin. And some people will grab a hold of that. God will forgive me if I go and ask Him. God knows your heart. And He knows the motives of your heart. Sometimes we just presume on God. But he's already told us, when I forgive you, go and sin no more. Loving others compassionately, compassionately means we must forgive them. There is a cost to this. We are told to forgive others just as God has forgiven us, freely and completely. If we do not forgive others freely and completely, God cannot forgive us. That's what Jesus said. We put a stop on what He can do in our lives, in our disobedience. If you forgive others their offenses, their sins, whatever they've done to you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. I think each one of us should write that out and put it on our door before we leave the house. Just to remind us of what we need to do each and every day. We are to forgive others even if they do not ask to be forgiven. Why should we? They don't want it. They didn't ask for it. So why should I give it to them? That's not our choice. God has made the command. Forgive others. Whether they ask for it or not does not enter into that equation. We are commanded to forgive as God forgave us. We cannot wait for them to ask before we forgive. That is not an option. And that is so hard to do. When we forgive those who hurt us, we acknowledge that we too have needed forgiveness for something. And that we are not as different from them as we'd like to think. There is a natural tendency in all of us to excuse our own sins, to justify what we did, to justify our weaknesses, to blame others for our faults, while at the same time blaming them for our faults as well as their own. We reach out for grace for ourselves but are not willing to give it to others. It is only in Christ that we are able to offer grace to those who offend us rather than seek justice or revenge. That's our natural tendency. It's often difficult to forgive because it seems so unfair. I've always said that God is not fair as we define fairness. God is just, but He tempers His justice with love, mercy, and grace. And He wants us to do the same thing. It'll take a lifetime to learn how to do that. To forgive others is to release them from any obligation to make up to you what they have taken from you. To forgive someone their sins against you, their offenses against you, removes any obligation of them paying it back to you. Louis B. Swedes wrote a book called Forgive and Forget. This is what he says. When you release the wrongdoer from the wrong, you cut a malignant tumor out of your inner life. You set a prisoner free, but you discover that the real prisoner is yourself. A lot of times when we hold a grudge and we want to get revenge, the person we want to get revenge against has no idea that we're hurt. To forgive as we have been forgiven by God is an act of faith, since it means that we are releasing the right to resentment, that we entrust justice to God rather than seek it ourselves. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We need to give him permission to do that. However, he wants to do that. But we also must remember that sometimes, in his timing, he seeks forgiveness first. 
just as we are to do. To forgive is an act of truth that it is only God and not we who can change another person. And that is what he's after, change, not revenge. He will do it in his own timing, not yours. <clears throat> but that's not fair. But God's not fair. He's just and merciful. See, we're not here to condemn a person. Our job is to share the gospel with them, to love them enough to forgive them and help them seek God's forgiveness. Jesus did not come to condemn the world because the world was damned, already condemned before him. He came to save the world. We, as saved people, do not have the right to condemn anybody else. Our job is to share with them salvation. Forgiveness is a decision you make of your will. Long after you are forgiven, the wound of the hurt will linger. As a Swedes further observed, he said, forgiving is not the same as forgetting. And sometimes we make those, we want to make those two the same, but it's not. Forgiving is not the same as forgetting, or excusing, or smoothing things over. True forgiveness is costly, especially when there is no repentance on the part of the wrongdoer. But it is the only way to release us and others from the bondage of guilt and to break the vicious cycle of blame. Part of the cost of letting loose of, of your pride, part of the cost is letting loose of your pride that can allow trivial things to corrode a relationship for years and even decades. I watched that in my own family. My mother and my aunt quit talking in 1969, I think it was. And as far as I know, it's not spoken together since. Now my mother probably won't be able to now, because she has Alzheimer's. She probably has no idea of anything that went on. But the outer grudge would not forgive. Part of the cost is letting loose of your pride and not forgiving. Loving God completely means we learn to love ourselves correctly and enables us to love others compassionately. When we learn how to love God completely with our entire being, we learn how to love ourselves correctly. In our culture, loving yourself correctly is, well, loving yourself is a big emphasis, but it's an incorrect way. We need to learn how to love ourselves correctly. And when we do that, we can also love others compassionately. And this means that we are loving enough to forgive.